I found with AI that it's like super impressive and obviously it's like everyone's talking about it, but the most compelling moments that you have with AI are often like the kind of mundane and simple ones. B2B Content Strategist is the podcast where you'll hear actionable advice and strategic guidance from content marketing leaders. I'm Amy Woods, CEO of Content 10X, and I sit down with leading B2B marketers to discuss how they overcome challenges with limited time and resources and execute winning campaigns time after time. If you want to improve and streamline your content marketing, keep listening. Hello and welcome to this episode of B2B Content Strategist. I'm your host, Amy Woods, founder of Content 10X, And in this episode, I have not one, but two fantastic guests. I'm speaking with Charles Haig and Catherine Threadgold from Glean. Now, Glean is a personal study tool that records classes, adds notes and transcripts, and lots more. Basically, it helps students to be more efficient. Charles is the head of product marketing and Catherine is head of brand. In our conversation, we talk about being a challenger brand and developing brand awareness. We also discuss how Glean reached their student age target market and the platforms that they have found most successful for that. Catherine and Charles both share their thoughts on AI and how they have used it to drive consistency and increase capacity. And we look at the power of customer stories and how they are using social proof not only externally as testimonials, but also to help focus and inspire people internally within the organization too. It's a fantastic conversation. So let's dive in. Charles and Catherine, welcome to B2B Content Strategist podcast. Ah, thank you for having us. Great to be here. As I was saying before we hit record, this is a first of interviewing two people for me, so it's going to test my interview skills. I'm very much looking forward to it. (laughs) So to get started, it'd be great to just do a little bit more intros. Just to start with you, Catherine. I know you are obviously head of brand over at Glean, but could you tell us just a little bit more about your role? Of course. Yeah. So I'm accountable for our brand's reputation, its perception and presence with audiences that are important to us now, but also those that we believe will be important to us in the future. So we're building a brand, a challenger brand within ed tech and learning technology. So what we're about is essentially building our learning authority and becoming a name that is well known within the industry. And we're going through the process right now of reviewing the structure of the team. So as we look at the business's priorities, so brand at Glean is actually now including brand marketing, design and creative events and community and content as well. And The reason it's in brand is because we want everything to start and finish with our positioning and our mission to become a learning authority. And so that's what I'm driven to to be responsible for. Awesome. That sounds fantastic. And Charles, how about yourself? Yeah, so I'm head of product marketing here at Glean. Uh, Quite new actually to the role, specifically not new to Glean. Catherine, I think we we started on the same day, didn't we? We were saying we come as a pair. It seems to have been a bit that way since the start of our time at Glean. But yeah, we started on the same day, so by no means new to the company, but product marketing is something that we're investing in a lot at the moment at Glean. Got a few job roles out there as we're growing the team. The kind of new focus of my role is very much on essentially the two sides of product marketing. So effectively bringing Glean's products to market and then the internal enablement and alignment of the teams around the customer and the product. And yeah, as with, I think all of the best product marketing, take a very customer centric approach. So. Content wise, there's obviously, there's, I think the interesting thing about content with product marketing is you've got uh, external content, customer stories, stuff around product launches, all of that good stuff. But then there's also quite a bit of internal content to think about as well. And all that enabling content for the other team, which is super exciting and is, it's good to have renewed folks on the both sides. Yeah, absolutely. And could you just explain a little bit about Glean as well? So just what does Glean do? So actually Glean rebranded from nearly two years ago now. So we've been around since 2007, I believe, uh, and our roots are in assistive technology to help students with disabilities to learn effectively. 
So when we rebranded to Glean, we shifted our positioning slightly to essentially cater for anyone who wants to learn effectively, who has challenges in the classroom. And, and that's what the Glean brand is about. It's about building motivation and enjoyment for learning and helping people to overcome learning challenges to become more effective in the classroom and to succeed. Yeah. And then, so the Glean product is, it's a study tool that focuses on letting students get, make the most from classroom learning. So there's a big note taking element to it, uh, but it also works around audio and transcripts and really helping people access classroom content or lecture content in a way that works best for them. There's a study process at the core of it. So as Catherine said, as a brand, we're all about learning the product. We would differentiate ourselves from a lot of other tools that focus primarily on productivity. We focus on learning and there's, if we call it core, so capture, organize, refine and apply, and we don't need to go into the detail, though, but essentially it's trying to create a scaffolded structured process for students that doesn't just help them do things faster or more easily or pull out the information they need quickly. We want to help you be more efficient, but we want them to be more efficient in a way that actually drives learning. And oftentimes with learning, it's actually going through the process of engaging with content and making that your own. That is what allows you to recall that information, which is a slightly different use case in note taking to say, for example, meeting actions when basically you want that bullet point, what are the things that I need to tick off and do? And it is a, when you talk about the product, so, you know, obviously there's a software, but is there also a physical component, like a physical product that comes with this as well? No, there isn't. There's nothing physical. We have an Android and an iOS app as well that is made more convenient in some scenarios than taking a laptop into class. But yeah, there's no physical component. works across, so it works in the web browser, so nothing to download, and it works on, yeah, Apple, Microsoft, and also Chromebooks as well, which is, which is one of the benefits of it not being like a downloadable piece because a lot of schools use Chromebooks and other 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 machines so i guess from a end customer perspective there's obviously a few different customer personas that you must be marketing out right yeah i guess i can maybe cover off from like the product point of view because we're in a essentially like a b2b to c model there's a few kind of paths to market but the general the overriding thing is that we are often selling to an organization for example a university that is then providing our tool to their students so that's an interesting dynamic. There's also people obviously just going to the site and buying it themselves. And then there's other partnerships, et cetera. But if we look at that, when you talk about personas, I think what's interesting is that you have the end user personas, the learner personas, and then uh, those buyer personas at the institution. So Catherine's mentioned our background comes from accessibility and supporting students with various different disabilities and any and other learning challenges, I guess. We, so similar to that, there's also students that struggle with stress or other mental health challenges. But then broadening that out, we could look at, we've got students who have a struggle maybe through a language barrier, so international students or students of English as an additional language. There's other pools as well that we would look at. Definitely there's different personas using the tool and then looking at, yeah, within who's on the organization side, there's, we've always focused on higher education specifically because the tool works really well in that lecture environment. We've got schools that use it as well, but it's yeah, mainly used in that lecture, higher education department. And then there's different departments within those that we would work with as well. And then from a brand perspective, we've got another layer. We're a challenger. We want to influence the industry. And so with that come a whole new set of influencer personas as well, where we want to be known, we want to develop our brand awareness. So yeah, it's quite a complex picture of who we're talking to and you know, how we navigate content in that way, uh, which is why you know, Charles and I are both here with different perspectives. Yeah, because that was my next question really around your overarching content strategy and what your priorities are, because I see that when you look at Glean, just looking from the outside and doing preparation, even for this conversation, you're very active on YouTube and do a lot of YouTube shorts and vertical videos. There's great presence on TikTok, which all makes sense aimed at the learners that you're looking to market to. You've got great content on the blog as well and in lots of events and 
as you mentioned before we here we call Catherine very involved in getting out there and meeting people through events what are the main content priorities that you guys are focusing on at the moment this year and talk about this holistically perhaps so from a brand perspective what i'm most invested in is our thought leadership strategy and how it relates to our content because i want it to essentially be driven by community enriched content that contributes to our wider content marketing strategy so whilst we use content for inbound purposes to drive growth and demand marketing we have another layer of need here too which is about positioning ourselves in the market making sure we're joining the right conversations and driving dialogue as well in places we can have the biggest impact and because we're a challenger activist brand Content is one of the best ways we can do that in different ways too, whether that be presentations and audio content through to sort of more developed editorial or SEO driven inbound, which I'd say that we refer mostly to for our sort of demand audience needs. Content, our content strategy is actually quite complex. Product marketing also have content needs that are different because that's about addressing the customer where they're at. Whereas from a brand perspective, content is going out and finding customers. It's a mix of thought thought leadership with really well-defined inbound content. Yeah, makes sense. And then Charles, from a product marketing perspective, where would your priorities currently lie from a content marketing? The big one at the moment is, is proof, making sure that we've got really great customer stories Uh, whether that be the people using the tool the people providing tool to learners i think that the voice of the customer is super important both internally and externally and a lot of these pieces of content around proof do also serve a bit of a double purpose i think it's great for obviously it's you're going to use testimonials and case studies etc externally but actually having people internally able to hear directly because not everyone has the opportunity to speak to customers day in, day out, or even as much less than that, be able to actually share the, the problems customers are facing and how the tools is a, sort, is, a, is a solution for them in their own words is critical. And then I think that, that can then seep into all aspects. It goes into the way that you, you approach copywriting and the language you use there. It, work, it helps across the business, I think. So, so I think proofs are a really important one and that's got internal and external benefits. And then I mentioned it earlier, product launches and feature launches is a big content focus for product marketing, getting that segmenting that by audience, because often, depending on how segmented your offering is as a product, but like essentially we have, we, we have one product, the glean is the product, but different people are going to use it in different ways and different people are going to look at different benefits from their use of it. So. Part of what product marketing's job is through content is being able to take the core kind of capability and then understand how to position that through content. So some people might want a big PDF to read about a tool. Some people might want to go to your TikTok account and see how it, how the new feature works. And you've got to understand the medium and the place as well as the message. Is there a a particular one of those long form written content, like white papers, PDFs, things like that, short form video. Is there a style or format that you do just see seems to resonate most when sharing those customer stories and customer experiences with the product? We have found in education that like the webinar format is king. Um, I have a few uh, hypotheses why that might be. I think the main one is that it works really well with the overall like, academic schedule, perhaps this would be a great thing for us or someone to actually dig into, like why, <laughs> but I, it does appear that being able to schedule a time to, to learn about a topic, whether that be a new feature or a piece of thought leadership, etc. I think we're doing a podcast now, right? So long form content is definitely huge across the board and webinars would fit usually within that fairly long form content. It's a nice medium that you can share your visuals you can do you can play around with the format quite well and then but that's definitely more on the the organizational side the b2b side i would say 
on the consumer side, the B2C or the end user piece, to be honest, I think we're still learning a lot of that. And I think it's a quickly changing environment as well. Yeah, definitely. We're, we've been experimenting now for the past six months in how to engage and build a community with, of students, of learners. And we've definitely learned a lot. You mentioned that we're active on YouTube Shorts. That has driven the biggest audience growth that we've seen so far. Um, we immediately went to TikTok. It felt like one of the most obvious places we were going to find our sort of younger student body. And we've certainly seen that. However, in terms of like actual content and topics, I don't think we've necessarily landed yet on what, what's going to drive that, that conversation and gain traction. So we're still in that experimental phase. It's interesting because the universities that we sell to through a B2B model are also in this place. They're trying to find where their student audience is and adapt. So it's been great to join those conversations from a vendor perspective and just understand it a little bit differently with them. And I'd say across the industry right now, we're not entirely sure how to engage this age group with content. We have great hypotheses and we're seeing some engagement growth in, in different areas, particularly social. But without a doubt, the best content form is video. It's the chat that we're experimenting with. That completely makes sense. And that's quite a consistent theme that we've been having across this second podcast season that we've done with the emphasis on video, especially when we've been speaking to organizations aiming at that younger Gen Z and younger population. In terms of your content marketing, like the, your workflows internally when you're producing, creating, distributing content, have you guys started to use AI much? It's a hot topic. Everyone's talking about chat GPT and everything. Is there anything that you've been doing to test, embrace, iterate with AI? Yeah, we have started using AI and it is one of our sort of company's goals across the business this year to you try and embed AI more into how we work. So we've tested Jasper AI and that's now part of our process. I think other tools that you don't necessarily immediately think of would be, we've got Brandwatch, we've previously used Outwater, so social listening, and that's AI collated insights. And they're fantastic for driving topical content that helps us engage, particularly with the younger audiences, because everything is quite thematic and topical. So they're great tools. Uh, I'm a writer myself. I now have embedded ChatGPT into just how I work. Not to write it for me, but to prompt direction. I found it incredibly helpful. Even just typing in, what does this audience group understand about a topic and getting that back. So it's helpful for tailoring content to audiences as well. Yeah, I found with AI that it's like super impressive and Obviously, it's like everyone's talking about it, but the most compelling moments that you have with AI are often like the kind of mundane and simple ones. Well, I think one of the best examples is, I don't know if you've used the Adobe AI that cleans up audio. So it'd be super useful for this exact use case where you're doing podcasts or any kind of recording remotely where you, not everyone has great mics. I'm just using my laptop to build mic for this but it will clean up the audio and make it sound like studio level. And that is really simple, but it suddenly puts a polish on all of your content, all your video and audio content that previously you'd have had to spend hundreds, thousands. It, it allows re you know, remote content to be created at that same level. Which And that's not it writing your entire content strategy for you. It's, it's just tweaking and finding what you've already got and I think that's generally at the moment feels like where AI can be the most helpful it's not in the big flashy showy use cases it's yeah just helping optimize at every level I completely agree so I'm not looking to replace the like human talent with my team with the AI in any way when it comes to content because you cannot put a value on human perspectives, on understanding an audience. Where I found AI to be particularly useful is in driving consistency, 
prompting idea generation and in- increasing sort of capacity in that way too. And I think tools, there's, there's a tool that I've been looking at recently. It's called Beautiful AI, which helps with brand positioning and the look and feel of the content you're producing. It, what it does, it helps you do that in an organic, consistent way. So I want to embed AI in a very human-centric way, which is exactly actually how we're talking about it as a company too. We're looking at AI for our own products and we want it to be essentially a platform to improve learning rather than replacing learning. And I think that's key to this is like how can AI give you building blocks to work with rather than replace those really human-centric skills. Yeah, I completely agree in the expertise and it can enhance and it can help with ideation, can't it? But at the end of the day, what it then spurts out needs to still be assessed by an expert. (laughs) You can't just trust what comes out. I love what you said, Charles, about more the kind of tactical tools that I suppose a lot of us are using and probably not really thinking that it's part of the AI spectrum in the same way, audio enhancement and things like that, because it's very good from those smaller tactical perspectives as well isn't it but as you said Catherine it's not really but a like the strategic area yet but uh, yeah it's good to just be embracing it and making sure that our teams are not worried about replacing but more enhancing and improving what we already do with the right tools just a super quick break from this conversation to let you know that if you're a B2B technology or professional services company and you want help with streamlining your content operations, outsourcing your content repurposing is the number one way to produce more high quality content and boost your ROI without putting any more pressure on your team. In fact, it could save your team up to 30 hours per week. We offer content repurposing services for video and audio content. Whether you have a show or you're launching a brand new one, Maybe you have an archive of awesome content, be it webinars or a virtual event, or you want help creating thought leadership content that we can repurpose, we've got you covered. Head to content10x.com to see how we can help you and start increasing your efficiency and the value you get from your content. Now back to the conversation. I guess I... Talking about that bit of a segue into the next area that I wanted to ask you about, which is around from a marketing perspective what do you decide is expertise that you really do want to keep in house and what kind of areas do you look to outsource from paid social or seo etc is the key key areas that you prefer to get those experts externally from versus in-house and vice versa it's a really good question i think something that we're constantly battling to understand better ourselves uh, we've got a really strong team at Glean with a mix of generalists and specialists. And I think we are now looking to expand with consultants and with, with agencies more because really it comes down to capacity. So those skills that we believe are driven by strategy internally, so from a brand perspective, our look and feel, for example, um, making that distinctly us. We're much more comfortable with that being driven by someone internally who understands the context and has a better idea of the path that we're taking. I think when it's additional specialism and expertise that we're experimenting with, I think that's when we can, we really look to agencies and consultants to help boost our growth. And then it's a continual assessment of when's the right time to bring it in-house, if it even is a right a right time. Because at the end of the day, agencies give us access to a whole host of spectacular talent just through one or two key relationships. Yeah. For me, it is. I don't think there's ever like a clear answer on this question. It is very much role or capability by capability that you'd look at it. But some things I like to think about are uh, if you're looking at the need for a particular capability or resource, is the need for that going to fluctuate a lot so if you're going to some months need tons of resource others there's not going to be any that's a really good point where you're going to outsource it because that's the beauty of an agency relationship is that you can have those working relationships where you add more capacity and not and it's also 
not a good experience for someone internally to be really up and down in terms of their workload. Again, if it's a, a, a Catherine, you were, t- you were saying this, but if it's a role where a significant amount of onboarding is needed to say, for example, really understand the brand and the direction we're going in, et cetera, then that for me is probably less of a, a less good candidate for outsourcing because you're going to spend six months building that knowledge. And then if you've put that investment into a particular person or group of people, it's probably best to have that in-house. But there's definitely not a clear-cut answer on either of those. It depends on budgets as well. So we might have more flexibility to increase our sort of marketing and brand spend versus increasing our sort of salary spend. Um, so we might have to make some decisions based on that at times, but I think it is something that we're constantly reviewing, but it's strategy led more than anything else. And also looking at the culture of the team, do we feel that actually bringing some new talent, new perspective into the team is going to energize? I think that's always something to consider too. Yeah, I completely agree with you. And as you said, priorities, budget, all play a really big role in all of that as well as culture and everything else completely makes sense. This next question, I'm going to ask you both actually, because you're both going to have different answers to this um, because it's quite personal. So I'll start with you, Catherine. Could you share one of your most memorable content marketing initiatives? So just something that really stood out in terms of like just a great content marketing initiative and the results of it. Yeah. So. I think the one I'm actually going to touch upon, I don't have necessarily any key metrics to share, though garnered a good audience, we had good traffic with it. It was more the strategy behind it, which I think it it recognized a shift in how we were approaching content. And that was our experiential learning content series that our content writer, Luke Garbett, put together. And the idea behind this was that we wanted it to help position the brand as a learning authority, moving away from our traditional stance previously of only being about assistive technology. But we looked at the content itself as actually showing the experience of learning. So this content wasn't just text. It had different ways to interact with it, had prompts with questions throughout where you could reflect on what was said. Uh, And it was a series, so you were asked to develop your knowledge over time. And I think this was a great example of how content can reflect brand mission, brand positioning. It can reflect the product as well, but also can be experimental in how you receive it. On the surface, it was long form content, but actually the different ways to engage with it meant that it did cater to lots of different sort of audience types. And it's a content series I'm actually really proud of and has formed the basis for how we approach content going forward. I was just going to ask you that if it's changed how you've done things going forward and clearly you said that it has, so what a great example. <laughs> yeah, definitely. And it was SEO driven at the same time. I mean, it took all of your standard content principles, but just looked at them through the perspective of what we wanted to stand for as a brand. And it, it was definitely a turning point for how we thought about content. Awesome. And Charles, how about yourself? You said most memorable. For me, I think it has to be the webinar series that we did over lockdown and COVID because we've always had good turnout, but we had like hundreds and hundreds of people on these webinars. We must have, it must have been 10 times the standard audience size and to the point where we weren't really prepared for that shift either. So like the beauty of, again, the beauty of the webinar, like platform or all of these, it, it's so scalable because it is like one to many, but that turned into one to a hell of a lot of people. Many, <laughs> yeah. Uh, many, many. Yeah. But what, there's, there's a few things that were really great about that. As, as, after we got over the initial, that's a lot of people uh, to be presenting to was, it was great to feel the community coming together in that time so that was the first thing was it and and i i think that's one of the reasons it that we did see that growth was that we did respond and create a space and we talked about the issues and we we obviously led we we wanted to be experts in the field but more importantly create a space for the real experts which is the people 
on the front line of supporting students in this new environment. We're still in that now where it's the, much more of a hybrid learning approach in many regards, but at that time, everything had gone online. Uh, you've got a complete new challenge for our customer base in providing support and helping learners. And yeah, I'm really proud of what we as a company, and I don't think any one person can take responsibility for that particular campaign. It was very, it was super reactive and super based on the community that we'd built over the long time and welcoming them in, getting people to come and speak and share how they were solving the problems of remote learning. And yeah, like the results were huge and we not necess and it's not necessarily all also about the immediate commercial result there. What the great thing about that was that we engaged and reached people and helped people through content and through creating a community and a platform that may or may not have gone on to purchase or may have purchased a year, to three years afterwards. But that is one of the powers of content marketing is you're able to actually provide value and a solution in a B2B world, especially well up ahead of someone actually having to come to a purchasing decision, which is fantastic for brand. And also from a product marketing point of view, recreating those spaces where people come and talk about their problems. That's a brilliant way of, as I said before, bringing the voice of the customer into everything you're doing, whether it be product development or content, et cetera. It's funny. That was actually my other example there. I thought it might be. I was thought you were going to yeah. say, I was like, oh. <laughs> and I was the host on that webinar series. I think what I'll remember most from doing that was I had never seen engagement like it um, with a series of content. And I think part, partly it was due to the time, but it showed how content can bring people together. It was entirely community driven, but also brand aligned. And I, I do think that we have built on that consistently over the last two, three years um, to the point where we have a very well attended regular webinar series. We have regular events and community meetings that are driven by content as well. And so that webinar series really did set us up for success with content marketing in a very simple, long form format that has actually, we, we've kept with it since then. And it was distinctly clean as well, which is why it works so well for us from a brand perspective. Yeah, that's awesome. Are you still hosting them now as well, Catherine? Or? No, not anymore. We have wonderful speakers from across the company who lead sessions. And I think the best thing about that is that our community audiences get to speak to different people across the company with different specialisms. And that's how we're growing it moving forward. Yeah, one of the key words that keeps coming up is community, isn't it? And it completely makes sense to do that. And strengthen and broaden the community by having more exposure to different people within Glean. So that's awesome. On the flip side, maybe you both have an answer to this or at least one of you, hopefully. Do you have any cautionary tales of content marketing woes where something maybe didn't quite go to plan or any kind of funny stories of marketing fails? <laughs> For me, none of like utter failure. There's been definitely a few initiatives that maybe more just fell a bit flat or didn't really get that traction. Uh, and I often with uh, the, the danger with content can be discovering a really great like hook or creative piece and then hanging the whole campaign off that with, and I, the, I think that's just in, in slightly the wrong order. I think what you want to uh, look at is. As you know, Kathy has been talking about brands. So it starts the brand strategy and it starts with what do we stand for? What's important to us? And then there's the kind of product marketing side of specific positioning for different target personas and the messaging there. And then you, then you arrive at the creative point and that's when with all that in place and that strategic piece done. And those foundations laid is that's when you, you start the creative ideation. And when you do it in that order, which can, doesn't have to be a super lengthy process like that, for the example we just shared about the, the kind of webinars around COVID and remote learning were super reactive and super quick, but they did follow that pro like process. Like we knew what we, or the brand and we knew what we wanted to do. And then we knew 
what our customers were going through and we responded with content that that was aligned with that. There's been a few occasions I went on like campaigns I've run where you, I just remember one that we did, which was play around with the, the that whole teach a man to fish, you fit, eat for a day, that whole metaphor. And it, it works and it, and, and it's not necessarily like a terrible campaign or anything, but I think the problem was I started with the clever bit, the analogy and saw an opportunity to do something creative. Whereas, and I, it probably, I, it just wasn't answering a specific pain point particularly well, and it wasn't landing with a particular audience so well. So that would probably be my caution to people is to use creativity to bring a strategy to life and turn a strategy from a pretty bland document that gets written internally to make sure everyone's aligned into something that people out there in the real world want to interact with and that elicits an emotional response that drives the strategy that you've determined rather than going, this is a really brilliant creative idea and let's try and match it to something that we want. Eve, that would be my my thoughts on on that kind of cautionary side of thing. I, I completely agree. And I think the one thing I would add to that is there are different types of content and you can't approach all with the same process and means of attack. There is a time and a place for SEO driven content. And you can't always be driven by keywords to create something that feels authentic and credible to your brand as well. Thought leadership is always going to be a slow burn. And you have to dedicate time and be consistent with it until you get results. So I'd say you can't apply the same metrics to every single piece of content. And you have to be wary of vanity metrics too. Whilst, whilst you might see some very quick wins with some areas of content that are quite easy to find a direction for, ultimately you have to hold true to what your strategy is and give it time and space. And the, there's been plenty of times where I've been caught in a trap of I've only got so many resources the team only has so much time to approach things and it feels like a bigger win to hit some keyword placements but actually what paid off in the long run was things like the webinar series look strategically at where you want to be using content effectively and keep banging that drum to leadership or whoever you're talking to to justify the time that you're putting into it that ultimately it's about your brand and it's a slow burn yeah and, and that's the thing isn't it keeping banging that drum and getting the right stakeholder commitment by understanding the strategy and what you're trying to deploy and the reasons behind that's awesome i've got three final quick fire questions you can both give me your quick fire answers so what would be a one tip that you would give your younger self starting out in your career in marketing quick tip if you had a minute with yourself i would say learn about what marketing is in its entirety as a strategic part of a business not just the area of marketing that you've been asked to be responsible for by that you should you don't need to know how to do it in the first in your first six months of marketing role but you should know essentially what market research is, what segmentation is, what targeting is, what positioning is, because then when people use these words, you'll know what they're talking about rather than just jumping to a conclusion in your head. So just do a bit of basic, unless you've been, you come from like having studied marketing at uni or something, if you haven't got that, just do a little bit of learning about the basics. I'd say to build upon that, never assume that you know your consumer or your audience your audience insight should always be backed up with research because you fall into a trap then if you come into a business and you're writing for a student and you're just a graduate but it's very easy to write for yourself uh, within marketing everything should be driven by your audience we've talked about being community driven and that's essentially what we mean remember who you're serving and ultimately that everything will fall together from strategy right down to writing that short blog as long as you, you have voice or customer in mind. Yeah, and it's a constant process of staying attuned to your customer as well, isn't it? So it's, it's not a done. tick box no. exercise at all. It's something that should be embedded in your day-to-day. -day. And I remember when I was first starting out, I used to 
someone told me like spend the first half hour of your day going out and just reading the news that you think your audience reads try and get into their mindset what are they seeing today and that was a great tip but I think really what that advice was saying was you're not your audience so continually think about who your audience are and what's influencing them and what they need yeah absolutely great advice love it (laughs) what's a typically overlooked or undervalued tool that you recommend that marketers should check out i would say messaging it's not really like a piece of software or anything fancy like that it's just knowing what messaging is versus what it's messaging isn't positioning and it's not copywriting it is a structure and there's tons of ways of approaching it uh, there's a guy who I follow called Anthony Pieri on LinkedIn who shares stuff around this, but find a framework that works for you as how to structure your messaging and yeah, use that and understand how to, because that will help you be customer centric because you'll define how you are customer centric and it will help you be super clear in communicating the value of your tool to target audiences and it will give breathing space for creativity and copy on top of that without meaning that you focus on, on, as I said before, not just focusing on like the kind of eye-catching creative side of it. I completely agree with you, Charles. I think the only other thing I would add would be creativity. And that sounds like a very abstract thing. Again, it's not a tool, but you need to very intentionally create space for creativity and actually it, within any marketer's role, creativity is a superpower. So look to create spaces, put time aside. We have collaborative sessions that are in the calendar on a weekly basis where anyone can bring something for us to be creative about. We use Jamboard almost obsessively. We make sure we share things that we've seen and be intentional about being creative because I've talked to many marketers who said, oh, yeah, I, lo- I, love, I love the idea of marketing because it was a creative job that I could go into. But you very quickly lose that intention if you're not consistent with it. And creativity is what was, makes us stand out as a brand. So be intentional about being creative. Yeah, absolutely love that. Right. I think sometimes people think it's they're going into something more creative and then for whatever reason within the organization start to feel the creativity draining away a little bit and you have to you have to make it part of the agenda as you guys do and I think people visualize it all being like Don Draper from Mad Men with a cigar and whiskey and just saying profound creative things all the time but it's not quite like that is it no and and everyone's creative creative in different ways that's probably exactly the thing as a leader and manager you have to recognize is that pulling everyone into a workshop is not how someone every person is going to be creative so really get to know the people you're working with and understand like how you can inspire creativity in them yeah absolutely so it's something that I've been trying to learn is just as a leader of creatives in terms of how to best motivate and all of that as well it's it's very important to just understand those different types of people with different skills that they bring to the table so really good So finally, if you could create any kind of content, um, so you've got limited, limited, sorry, budget, unlimited resources. So it could be some kind of reality TV show at Glean or big billboard in Gloucester Square or Times Square or something like that. What would jump out to you as if we did that, if Glean did that, we've got all the money, all the resources, that would be amazing. I actually have one that's on my Glean bucket list that I put, I did a stretchy document and part of it was aspirational to the point of might never happen. And I would love for Glean to have its own TED Talk series, like akin to a TED Talk series. We're about learning and enjoying learning. And one of one of the brands that screams that for me is TED and the TED Talk. So that that would be my absolute dream. I love it. The thing I think of in the moment is Apple have just launched their Vision Pro, right? The kind of augmented reality. I think they're, are they calling it spatial computing though? The call to, to see what content options that kind of tech would bring. Probably need a sizable user base to, to make it worth investing in just yet. But uh, I think it's like over three grand for a headset, right? Maybe, maybe wait until it gets like cheaper 
more people to access it. But yeah, like the idea of, I don't even know what that would look like, but the experiential opportunities of a medium like that is super interesting. And you could see, you can see a lot of opportunities to convey the problem, like put people in scenarios, in lectures, in classrooms, in different kinds of environments, or even how will, if this, if that kind of tech takes off, how will that actually change learning itself? And yeah, so yeah, that would be, that'd be interesting if we could somehow leverage that kind of technology. Yeah. Invest in some big R and D type project fully work out what Glean could do. Yeah, that would be awesome. But like you said, it's that kind of technology has got the potential to really impact learning overall and the whole educational experience, hasn't it? So it's quite interesting to see what's going to come from all of this. And just AI, I mean, like this time next year, things will be very different in the world of education, I guess. So it's all exciting times. <laughs> Thank you so much for coming on to the podcast. It's been absolutely fantastic. Really enjoyed the conversation. Is there any way you'd like the listeners to go to find out more about yourselves, connect with you on LinkedIn or anything like that? Yeah, definitely search for my name and Catherine's. I'm sure we'd like people to reach out if they on LinkedIn. Yeah, nothing major. I mean, if people are interested in learning a bit more about Glean, get in touch with us happy to talk more about that as well and yeah i think basically just thanks so much for having us on really enjoyed it it's been great chat definitely and you know what part of the motivation of us taking part in this is to be part of our own community our own area of expertise so would love to hear from people on linkedin and just to have a chat and just to understand a little bit more about what's going on in your own worlds yeah absolutely we'll put links to obviously glean and also both of your LinkedIn profiles in the show notes. If you connect with Charles and Catherine, be sure to pop in your connection note that you heard them on B2B content strategists. That'd be really cool. <laughs> so thank you so much then. Once again, it's been great talking. So yeah, thank you. Thanks for listening to this episode of B2B content strategist. Do let me know what you thought of our conversation by getting in touch with me on social media. You'll find Content 10X on all the social platforms or search for Amy Woods, CEO of Content 10X on LinkedIn. To find out more about streamlining your content marketing processes and specifically about content repurposing, check out our website, content10x.com, where you'll find information and resources that will help you achieve more with your content more efficiently. And if you're looking for a partner to outsource your content repurposing and distribution to, get in touch as we offer a world-class, fully end-to-end, done-for-you content repurposing service. Thanks again for listening to this episode, and I'll catch you in the next one.